Hello, I'm Lindley Crosswell, CEO and Director of Museums Victoria. Our museums have an important role to play in providing a platform for open, informed and evidence-based discussion on some of the most important and relevant issues facing us today, both here in Victoria and around the world. And so we've created our Thriving Futures series of discussions to do just that to bring together thinkers, innovators, and leaders with diverse perspectives to consider current issues and how we can create a thriving future together. Today's conversation focuses on the path forward out of COVID-19 and the role that arts and culture can play in helping to rebuild communities after two years of pandemic disruption. Museums Victoria respectfully acknowledges the traditional owners of the lands where we work the Wurundjeri and Boonwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation and First Peoples language groups and communities across Victoria and Australia. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and their emerging leaders. Our organisation, in partnership with the First Peoples of Victoria, is working to place First Peoples living cultures and histories at the core of our practice. Could I add my... Gratitude to the Indigenous owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects, but also, as a personal note, add my impatience for a treaty or treaties in order to at least start to address some of our failings in the past and to set the stage right for a better future. We're here to talk about Melbourne's recovery, and there is no simple solution, but we have available to us on screen with Vicky and with those delightfully, we have to all agree, I'm sure, in person, we have people with very divergent perspectives. And Sandra, if I could start with you, is, mm. is it the time now, at last, to talk about something other than health? Are we ready to start talking about culture? I think we are. It's funny, when I, when I was studying uh, to do my PhD in epidemi epidemiology um, and everyone thought at the time that um, that meant I was doing my PhD in bugs, um, and um, I remember thinking, gosh, imagine if one day there's a time where on the news in the evening we report on a health metric of our population like we do our economic metrics or the weather. Um, I think I'll be more careful what I wish for in the future, John, because jump forward to this time and obviously that, that's the reality around us. It's all your fault. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but I think it is, it is the time. I mean, um, we've been through this incredible period of upheaval and transition um, every aspect of our lives has been changed and influenced. Um, and to think that kind of we're going to return to a pre-COVID world, um, you know, it, it is going to continue to shape our future. Um, but it is important, I think, now that we're getting to a point where vaccination rates are, are high. We understand, you know, more papers have been published about this virus in the last two years than um, most of the common household germs in the last 200 years. We understand a huge amount about this virus um, and how to control it. Um, and, and in many ways, Victorians, and I think we need to give a big shout out to the Victorian community uh, for the way that they have responded, um, you know, stuck together and got through this remarkably yeah. to have one of the highest vaccination rates in the world and to be opening up with such a level of optimism and confidence um, is true testament to the, to, to the you know, steadfast leadership of Victorians. I mean, we should be hitting 90% double-vaxxed about now, uh, which is very exciting. Vicky, we can't have any conversation about culture without looking at the Indigenous culture. How do we integrate the Indigenous culture, to which we're so indebted, into the revival, given that it's until recently just been a kind of a bit of an add-on off to the side all on its own. How do we integrate it better? Oh, well, that's a big, big question. Lots of answers. There's no one size fits all for sure. Um, I think that the opportunity now is to recalibrate our society and our culture, how we all live together into the future. Um, it's, it's right now. Uh, as we said, we've been through this period of great upheaval and change. And people have had time to reflect and to understand and even to have a sense of um, somewhat a sense of what our peoples have endured in terms of having our freedoms and our rights and those things um, under scrutiny and certainly under, you know, being locked down. Um, that's what happened to 
our people. And so I think people have got a lot, lots of opportunity to reflect on things and how do we move forward into the future. And yes, treaty is one of those um, ways. And, and truth telling? Oh, totally truth telling. There's lots, there's lots to be told. And in the museum, we have the first people's exhibition and a section is called Our Shared Story. And um, as Annie Dye and um, Uncle Henry and that will know, that was certainly the Ewing group who pushed for our shared story because it is our shared story since colonisation and we all have to deal with how it is now and how we live into the future. So do we integrate it at every point? Because at the moment, I mean, there are, let's not pretend, mm. there are large groups of the community who think it's all a lot of nonsense and they don't care. How do we make it so that everybody cares? Some of those strategies that people are doing now, again, the museum, for example, in transformational strategies, reconciliation action plans in institutions, and it starts with individuals uh, everywhere to be taking that on and, you know, the consequences of not um, embracing at the First Peoples here, but the diverse communities of the world that call this place home as well as the globe, you know, we are in a, a time for all of humanity mm -hmm. to, be, mm -hmm. um, to be very concerned. And whilst we're in recovery from COVID, mm -hmm. um, there is the bigger picture stuff and I think there's a lot that needs to be done to address how we live into the future and, and Indigenous peoples here and around the world have have a lot to offer and have been sitting down waiting to be heard. So, yeah, um, it's actions and, you know, often actions speak louder than words. So it's those actions that people need to take. Okay. So, Kath, the work the Torch does is working with prisoners post-release and trying to break the cycle of recidivism. So how do we work some of those sorts of incredibly practical and important things into a bigger picture about culture? Well, I suppose we're very um, lucky. This is an incredible organisation, the Torch, a not-for-profits arts organisation that works in prisons and in post-release with the aim of um, connecting Indigenous Australians back to their, their land and their language and their mobs and telling their stories in their own ways. And as part of the project that I've been involved with for seven years, we've um, it's really exploded to the wider community. There have been exhibitions held online and murals and works commissioned, and it's really been a great and wonderful snowballing effect. More people have been exposed to these incredible storytellers, these incredible and beautiful artworks, and uh, Victorians are very lucky because... Of course, um, arts and culture to Victorians is not just a, um, a medicine, some sort of, um, some sort of treatment for, mm. to make us feel better. Mm. It's, for us, it's like our oxygen. Mm. You know, we need it to, to be alive and to be the best version of ourselves in, in the ways that it challenges us and comforts us, in the ways that it um, presents us just with respite and um we're, we're so lucky and I'm, I couldn't be um, more delighted to talk about the torch at every opportunity because <laughs> the more people who know about this incredible organisation and the more we can, the more I can help share the stories of the people who have lived here for more than 60,000 years and the more every day I'm learning these stories and they are wonderful stories. Mm -hmm. Sam, you've worked in the arts and... Yes worn many different hats. A lot of people think about culture and they think culture is the arts, but in fact culture is a lot more than the arts. But take us through the role of the arts as part of the cultural revival that Melbourne's itching to get stuck into. Uh, yes, absolutely, and Melbourne is. Um, so the arts, uh, I think, is in many ways can be the soft, uh, the soft way forward on a, a harder uh, cultural um, focus or cultural outcome. Um, it can be the, the accessible point of, of engaging with ideas and discussion and then um, and you can unpack that. And I think, um, as Catherine was saying, um, we are perhaps unusual in Victoria um, because we have such an engaged community that they take those opportunities with both hands. Um, and the momentum that you described um, is what I see in the arts and, and through our, one of our own programs, M Pavilion, where um, in the first year we had 150 events 
um, which we curated. We decided what they were and we showed Melbourne what we thought could happen in a design space in a beautiful parkland setting. Um, and fast forward eight years, we have a thriving program of 500 plus events over the next six months that um, are all free and are generated from the community coming in and, and inhaling the resources that we've created um, and, and breathing out um, at the, the, today how, how we're going to live together. Um, so, yeah, I think the arts is, is a tool to, to go into that broader scope that you described. Mm. All right. Now, I've got a wonderful gadget here in front of me and your questions come straight through to my screen. So don't be shy. Feel free to ask. And the first question is, are we ready? How do you give people confidence, Sandra? That comes back to a medical <laughs> issue in a way, to make people feel confident that, um, dare I say it, the state government, Kath, uh, that they've actually got the right steps, the right measures in place that people can confidently mix and mingle, which is kind of inevitable if you're talking about cultural revival. Look, I think confidence, it's not just um, set by the state government. I think, um, you know, confidence is almost an intangible. It really comes back to trust and um, it's going to take time. You know, we know that after traumas or after major you know, experiences like we have all been through, um, it does take time to re-acclimatise, to rebuild. For some people, probably about 20% of the population, they'll be out there tomorrow mm. um, and, and we can't stop them. For 20%, it will take them a long, long time. And for a group in the middle, you know, it will be a process of, of quite a few months um, to, to find their new normal, to test, to feel safe. Um, I remember when we first took the masks off um, just last week, you know, you, you almost feel like you're doing something wrong or you mm. feel a bit naked. Um, and that's very normal. It's, it's in our psychology that we have felt safety in our homes. We've felt safety behind a mask. Um, and while culture and the arts and journalism and, and content got us all through and kept us safe, I think just as importantly and equally made a contribution as our public health teams did over the pandemic um, to the the, the psychological and, and cultural safety of Victorians. Um, you know, that, that will take time to, to find our, our new pathway and our new normal, um, and it will be different for everyone. And I think it's important also not to judge ourselves or to judge others if that does take time. Um, you know, I think with more than 90% of Victorians now vaccinated, uh, we, we're a jurisdiction and a community that is very firmly focused on sticking together and looking to the future. Um, but, you know, that will be a different path for each individual. Yeah, we've become very judgmental. I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that, but, Sam, you're also involved, You, amongst the many hats I mentioned mm. before, you wear a hat which gives us an entry to the world of philanthropy. Yes. Uh, what's the role? I mean, there are people who have done very, very well, just, mm. as, well yeah. just as much as there are people who have done very, very badly. And I, I just wonder at what point, do we turn around as a community and say, oi, come on, yep, yep. give something I, back? I agree. And, um, and I was really pleased to see that an immediate action from the philanthropic community around Australia um, as the uh, as COVID unfolded was uh, to um, band together and um, simplify processes of mm -hmm. gaining money, um, relieve people of their obligations on reporting, um, and be very, very flexible with how people could deliver their programs. Um, and I think that that's been uh, an essential leadership role of that um, section of our community. Because I agree with you that, that that's, that's, the, um, that's the group that are putting back in. And uh, hopefully in, in many ways, this conversation is going to touch, I think, on, on norms that we need to get to. So we, we could look forward mm -hmm. to seeing the, um, the Melbourne Museum open the JobKeeper Rorts Pavilion. Yeah, <laughs> this is just it. It's, with with it's... a fraction of the money that some people put into their pockets that well, they and, didn't need, mm. didn't use, didn't deserve, could be repurposed for public philanthropy, perhaps. Yep, yep. And can't help but thinking just straight out tax would be helpful too. Mm. But yes, um, yeah, I think that there is a role for philanthropy and philanthropy can take risks that other money can't take. Yep. And I think that's a very important space for it to be working in. Um, certainly uh, with the Naomi Milgram Foundation, uh, Naomi looks for the risk. Um, she actually leaves the things that are secure to maybe more established groups that have stronger controls and, and she's looking for where you can apply that for maximum benefit. Which is the ethos of entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. that makes people sometimes phenomenally wealthy in the first place. But Vicky, if we're talking about equality and equity and inequality, I mean, the, the Shepparton community in particular felt the brunt in Victoria uh, unequally of some of the public health measures. So what would get through at that level? What would, be, what would you be suggesting or recommending 
as a way of trying to use culture as a lever to recover for a community like that one? Um, I think we've got that covered. We know what to do in our communities. We have the answers. It comes back to the fundamental questions again and um, at the risk of um, sounding like I'm banging on the same old drum, but I want to know which communities are sticking together and which communities are doing what and which communities are, um, <clears throat> you know, benefit, benefiting the things that have just been said because... Um, there's still great inequity in the, in this community that we all supposedly live in, not just in Melbourne and the state. And for Aboriginal people, there isn't still isn't safety. And you're yeah. talking about safety in the homes and safety. There's still people dying in, um, you know, when they're being held in um, jails and things. Um, you know, nothing's being done about that. We're still experiencing those um, extraordinary numbers. Um, the, the issues that uh, underpin all the disenfranchisement of our communities are still there and, and it speaks to larger issues. And there's, um, if, if there's a way forward, we, we've got culture covered, except, of course, there's no resourcing for that. Mm. Um, you know, the state doesn't really resource cultural um, activity, how we determine that. You so mean, by resource, you mean paying money, mm. funding it? Well, yeah, funding for a start. You know, yeah. you want to talk about money. Um, you know, it's pretty hard to come by. I'm the co-chair at the Victorian Aboriginal Corporation for Languages and we receive no state funding. And language is central for ongoing sustainable language revitalisation work. We get project money and we're aiming to, you know, have a chat to the minister one of these days um, if we can get an appointment to, to address that. But the inequities, there's $20 million spent across Australia for the oldest living languages in the world at the fastest attrition rate. Who cares about that? Nobody. And we've just had a global pandemic, yes. So this speaks to all of our human rights. And I was reflecting, well, there's a couple of things I'm a bit cranky about. I think parity is the way forward. There has to be parity. And parity means economically, socially, culturally. So... You know, you want to talk about tax and land, pay, pay the rent so that we have economic parity to sit at the table and have these partnerships with the government that they keep telling us about that they want to have and they ostensibly are having partnerships and engagement with us. I'm also on the First People's Direction Circle. Our role is to give direction to Vic, Creative Victoria and, and we are doing that. But the system is so, you know, self defeating and can put so many constraints on things. Oh, it can be complex and hard to lock horns with. I'll come back to you about some of the specifics. Kath, one of the great mistakes that governments often make and funding organisations often make is one size fits all. Oh, well, you know, um, we did something with the torch, therefore let's roll that out and do it, you know, five times bigger or five times more. What are the lessons you've learned from being involved over so many years now about taking the advice from people bottom up rather than trying to impose it top down? Um... I think it's um, it's been a really eye-opening opportunity to sit at the table with um, people who have this lived experience. You know, I, I'm a student of history and I've always been interested in Australian history. I remember writing a, a poem about um, an, an imaginary tribe who I thought might have lived in a creek bed near where my nana grew up in Mornington. Um, so I've always oh, been... Can, can you remember any of it? No, I can't remember anything, any of it, but it, <laughs> but, but it was about a corroboree and it was about um, the Tantai Creek. So I've always imagined okay. that there were, um, there were stories that I didn't know about, that I wanted to know about. And so um, I advocate every day for my work with the torch and... And the more we can work together, of course, the better outcomes they'll be. And I understand your frustrations, Vicky, because um, they're very real. Yeah. So I Absolutely. think we've got to keep listening and working together and that's how we'll get the best outcomes. Sure. Just still, though, on that issue, the torch has evolved, even just from what little I know about it from talking to people since it started. I mean, it's kind of changed its model a bit over the years. So tell us how it's evolved to the point where it's so successful now because when it started out it didn't show that promise to be quite blunt we um we have uh government funding um which is great we uh have philanthropic funding 
which is fabulous. Um, we have the project is run by people who understand the Victorian justice system. They've been in it. They've been part of it. So the lived experience. That's exactly right. And not just the lived experience about being in prison, but the lived experience of being an Indigenous person living in this place or in places around the whole country. You know, it's not just a person living now. It's the generational, intergenerational trauma, which I have learned about. So when you have a pro program that is driven by the people who benefit from the program, um, you see the benefits. So over seven years, we've gone from a handful of people running a project to reconnect people in the Victorian justice system um, to their language and culture and place to um, a huge amount of people now in our post-release program who stay connected with us and in touch with us and who are flourishing in the world yep. and recidivism is being reduced. So it is a wonderful program. Which is what it's all it's about. It's working. So um, just coming back to you on this, Vicky, before we go on to back to the more traditional arts side of things, which there's lots of questions coming through, and thank you, I will work get towards them. Um, just because something works with the torch doesn't mean it works in Shepherd and doesn't mean that works in Robinvale, doesn't mean that works in Lake Tyres, doesn't mean it's going to work in Warrnambool, for instance. So how do we go about trying to persuade the bureaucrats and have you had any success persuading bureaucrats to let communities be more self-directing? Well, this is, a, this is a thing that's been going on. I've been working in Aboriginal community affairs for over 40 years on boards and committees and working towards bringing about that change. And the, and the government has, uh, you know, has got a new approach. But in some parts of it, it's the same mouse wheel. My father and my grandfather and those before us have been sitting down saying the same things, yep. you know, to the government. So, you know, to change the system, you know, the treaty stuff, I'm, I'm a big one for following in Norway and the Sami peoples and having um, our own parliament so that we can be sovereign and autonomous and self-determining because that's what sovereignty is, to be well, autonomous and self-determining. We'll see whether we go down that path or more the Canadian path, which I think is the and, one a lot of people know, are attracted to. And, the arts to. and culture are inextricably mm. linked and you can't separate them. Yep. Mm. yep. Right? And that is our way and our our way forward. But it's... Um, sorry to be so crabby and grumpy yeah. today, but it's, it's a lot. <laughs> The lines in the sand, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. for us here in Victoria, us here in Australia, and us as human beings in the planet. All right. And it's very urgent that we, we get with the program. Okay, thank you. And I'll come back to you. Sorry. Sam, I want to combine a couple of different questions here and then get Sandro's view on it as well. And I'm going to merge these. Um, there's a lot going on in the city. Mm -hmm. What have you seen that you think is showing some spark that should be nurtured? And then someone else is saying, well, what about the influences post-COVID? Are you seeing specific things that are emerging from the fact people have been more, well, being locked away, people have been self-reliant? I think that we're seeing um, the 2020, we talked about percentages of people's engagement. We're seeing a really strong response to a concept that is advertised and sold out within six minutes, or I think maybe been less. 150 seconds. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, and so there's a really strong desire to reconnect, to celebrate, to mm. joyously um, be together again. Um, but um, there's a very significant group of people who we do need to give space and understanding to who are who are, um, who are re engaging uh, more um, more slowly and one of the things that uh, I think is really important is that things look safe from a distance that you know as you approach the the museum the gallery the event the theatre show that you're going to be safe it's okay to go into the cinema because things are being done properly so people can build that confidence to, to re-engage. Um, so Picasso had a blue period and a green period or whatever else I can't remember, but are we going to have a post-COVID period? I think, I think we're on our way into it right now, and this is one of the reasons I'm so excited about um, the summer ahead, is that we've actually built the M Pavilion. It's a crazy, wonderful M Pavilion this year, open grid full of mirrors, and it's just crazy and joyous, and um, I'm confident that what we're going to see is those conversations start, and why culture has so much to offer is it's about storytelling and making sense of it and processing it together and not on our own. And I think there's been an amazing um, growth in online presentations mm -hmm. and we're going to keep that. And that's made an, an incredible efficiency. I don't think we'll stand for poor quality anymore. I think that we've done lots of exploring. We'll expect it to be done well, like it is today. Um, but I think that's great and we'll keep it. But I think that live connection, those conversations, those debates are going to be uh, fundamental in crafting what comes next. Sandro, it's really hard 
to understand the depths to which some people have gone. Mental health, we know, in particular young people's mental health, but by no means is it only young people's mental health. It's an issue post-COVID. So how do we project this optimism in order to encourage people to, you know, like a turtle, poke their head out of the shell and have a look around again? Well, first, I just want to reflect on one of the previous points, because I think it's really important to acknowledge that actually um, one of the key learnings for bureaucrats, including myself, um, through the pandemic has been the strength and the importance of the place-based community-owned and led co-design process. So really, it was only when Victoria really lent into a decentralised approach, um, giving power back to communities and working really strongly and closely with between the public health community and where there is traditional uh, trust and power uh, in the community and the incredible strength in the community that we're able to get, you know, that surge in um, vaccination rates. Of course, it was associated with access and, and all those sorts of things, uh, availability as well. But I think a key learning of the pandemic for bureaucrats, for government, has to be that actually communities hold the knowledge, the strength, the solutions. We need to provide uh, opportunity, access, the supports, maybe connect and, and share, allow opportunities to share best practice and insights between community leaders, but we don't have the answers. And so um, we're a major funding agency. Uh, we, we provide about $30 million worth of funding across the state through health promotion partners, uh, whether it's on the ground programs or uh, through running, for example, the quit line with Cancer Council. Um, what we've seen when we listen to communities and when we spend time um, visiting community leaders is that young people have been hardest uh, hit. It's, it's also supported by the population surveillance data that we've collected, um, whether it's food insecurity, social isolation, psychological stress, um, or retreating into um, you know, loneliness, rate, rates of loneliness and, and, um, uh, and, and other forms of um, psychological um, distress I mentioned. So um, we've launched a program called Future Healthy. It's a $45 million three-year investment. It's co-designed by young people. It's digital driven, but it does have also non-digital uh, elements for, for, you know, cognizant that um, there are still, there is still a digital equity divide across regional and rural Victoria. So what does it do? Can you give us a sort yeah, of so, Yeah, so on? one piece in that, we've just launched um, the Big Connect which really is based on the insight that when we spoke to young people, what they wanted were opportunities to reconnect safely and socially across 2022. They just wanted to be together uh, in their own way, designed in a way that, that suits them at the local level. So it doesn't look the same all across the state. Uh, we're delivering um, $5 million worth of investment that will go out through cultural arts, local cultural arts sporting, active recreation, food and youth organisations. So we're so not, not going to roll not out... Screen -based. Sorry, not screen based. No, uh, and it's and it's not. Well, it could be hybrid. I mean, again, it's it's up to local young people in those communities to decide with those local organisations that know their communities and know them best. So, Lighthouse Foundation in Shepparton working with young people across Shepparton, not us rolling a program out across Shepparton from Melbourne, okay. um, giving them the power, the resources, understanding that they hold the solutions, um, but giving them that backing and 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 knowing that. The trust we have in them and the trust that the community has in them is critical to the whole process of healing. But you can't prescribe and then dispense optimism. You can't go to the pharmacy and say, hi, can I have no, 100 grams of optimism? So what do you do to replace that? Because people are, quite frankly, a whole lot of people are panicked. I mean, I'll, I'll come to Vicky in a second. You talk about, you know, people in remote communities mm. and, you know, they hear what you're saying and go, well, that's not going to affect me. Mm. And I think, you know, I don't think there's a simple answer, John, and I think it will take time because this is what Vicky's talking about is intergenerational, you know, trauma and uh, oppression and um, inequity. This is not just two years. Mm. Um, and that is going to take time. Um, and I don't, I, def, I, I certainly don't pretend to have the solutions. Okay, so it's um, like how you eat an elephant, which is one mouth at a time, as everybody I'm sure knows by now. Mm. Um, you can't do everything at once and there's no kind of magic wand. Is that right? <clears throat> Well, I bet I, but that also shouldn't stop us from taking the actions that we can take yeah. within our own power and understanding where that, that the power and privilege that many of us hold is an important part of the, of the process of, of healing for Victorians broadly okay. um, after what has been a, a bruising two years, but, but you know, with an important yeah. um, focus and outcome in that. 
Vicky, if there was one program you could get some money for, and don't make it language your pet project, just generally from the point of view of, say, young people in the community, what would you put some money into? Give me an example of something that you know would work. Mm, that's a that's a hard one because there's so many areas to address. Mm. Uh, I think bringing people together, the young ones together, in the way that they self determine. Because mm. what Sandra said, the values and principles around community, having the answers and the knowledge, and the government to you know support and just hand out the the uh, support rather than to dictate what needs to happen. Uh, you know, our 16 year old granddaughter is being locked in her room for two years, just about. <laughs> um, she is a shy person, but um, we need to encourage them to be back and reconnececting. Yeah. Sure. And, and but so I can understand of Sandro's program, I'm going to look it up and yeah. see. Sure. But so a lot of people say, oh, look, sport's the great thing. It brings kids together, especially Indigenous kids, and that's a great way of getting them you know, out of the turtle shell and out of the bedroom and so on. But sport's often dominated by boys and, you know, sometimes it's the girls then that get left out. So is there, are there some suggestions or some examples you know of that you say, oh, well, look, you know, we should have a closer well, look we've, at? We've, um, we've had, um, and I, it's not my, just my pet project, it's a passion and it's a, an essential thing in community for language revitalisation because it, feeds into and is across and part of every other aspect of our lives. Yep. So we've had a language camp and the young ones uh, who came with the families um, engaged, they weren't on their screens, they were out, they were in the bush. So we need supports, I think, in our communities to do that family reconnecting mm. and supporting our oral traditions of telling stories and gathering and sharing um the wisdom from the elders and connecting families again. We've built resilience. That's why we're still here. We've mm. experienced, lived it, you know, um, as Sandra pointed out, from the transgenerational traumas of invasion and we're still here and um, I think that, you know, for our young people, bringing them together to support their um, engagement and understanding of themselves, particularly teenagers. That's, mm. that's the, mm. you know, the, sure. the years when you are finding yourself, um, getting them back out on the country with the elders and family. Sam, one of the big issues with funding at the moment is that a lot of people are saying, oh, the government has to do this, you know, chuck another yeah. billion on the Barbie sort of thing. Yes. But there's a lot of, especially in the arts, there's a lot of very entrepreneurial people. Um, you know, we all miss Michael Gininsky almost every day, but there's, a, you know, there's dozens of people that have that same spirit and flair. So how do you nurture them? How do you get them? Are they ready to take a risk and how do you make it a little easier for yep. them? So we've started to understand ourselves better within our foundation that we're looking for exactly what you just described, leaders, um, whether the creative individuals or the organisations that um, our founder, Naomi Milgram, um, has been identifying for a long time and supporting. A really good example that actually um, addresses some of the things that Vicky was just talking about um, is our work with um, Deborah Cheatham and the Dungala Children's Choir, mm -hmm. and let alone the work that Deborah does generally, working with um, uh, traditional language to uh, make uh, contemporary compositions of new works that um, are part of our shared uh, um, understanding and, and the response that comes from that. We're talking about optimism. Um, the response that comes from that is um, incredible, that the sellout audiences at the concert hall um, and, and repeat performances around the country. Yep. Um, and every time uh, we open every pavilion with a song in language by Deborah um, and uh, the response from the audience is always very strong. Um, and so, yeah, it's... It, and so from our point of view, Deborah is someone who we would always back and support and um, and she has so many projects going on and we're involved in many of them. Um, and so we, we clone Deborah Cheatham, do we? No, no, I've not cloned. Uh, well, in a way, Deborah is one I of those... I do because uh, I'm involved in projects with her too. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> and and, um, and the, it, uh, in terms of cloning, she's an incredibly generous person. She, she will is. always put people in front of her, always. And, en and energetic. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but, a good example. But it is a good example. And in fact, mm. there's a strong correlation. I remember years ago there was a study. Um, the most democratic societies in the world were the ones that had the highest proportion of people involved in choirs. Oh, right. Mm. And uh, whether it's cause or effect, nobody quite knew at the time. Maybe there's been another study since. But there's no doubt it brings people mm. together. Mm. So, Sandro, do we, in traditional medical terms, do we try and measure these things or do we just build on them and say we don't know why it works, we just know it does? 
Oh, we, we absolutely have to. And um, interesting that you talk about, you know, high, uh, you know, most democratic having um, a number of people in a choir. I mean, that makes absolute sense. The common, the commonality there would be social contract. Um, you know, it's trust in society. It's trust in each other. I, I spent three years in Denmark doing my PhD and you, you, you think, well, why does Denmark have an obesity rate a third of the UK? Their genetics is almost identical because the, um, uh, the Vikings went back and forth for, thousands, for hundreds of years. Um, and it's because of social trust, trust in government, and that allows them to then um, achieve important um, collective policy, you know, social policies and a, and a long-term commitment to building things like um, you know, social fabric as an outcome. So I think as we now herrings versus kippers, yeah, well maybe it's also the fish and the yeah the herring which I never got into um, pickled herring, um, but I, I do think it's really important as we look to recovery we need to learn from the last two years and so some of the work that we're doing with Vcos for example around what does a well-being economy look like yep. so how do we build this into the business of government so that actually long term we're not measuring GDP as a measure of success in in life like we shouldn't be valuing ourselves on, on our incomes? How do we actually measure some sort of progress as a society? Um, and that has to come back to, you know, issues of health equity, which is not equality, it's very different, but actually, you know, truly tackling issues of power, privilege and inequity, um, which ultimately result in poor health, whether it is a virus or heart disease, mm -hmm. they, are, they are driven by the same common causes. Um, and, and we need to build those into the business of government and then hold ourselves as a society through government, who is a reflection of us, um, accountable uh, over, over a long period to achieving that. Mm. Kath, let's not pretend you don't have a vested interest in this conversation, but whilst at the same time acknowledging you're not going to comment about the government that your husband leads, <laughs> but the role of government, whoever's in mm. power, can we talk about that? Because we've talked about philanthropy and private sector investors and all of those other things. One of the surely great lessons that COVID's taught us is that when the sticky stuff hits the fan, mm. it's only government that can fix it. Isn't that the most profound lesson? All this nonsense, I'll leave it to the private sector, government get out of the way. That's the most fundamental thing, isn't it? Well, this is the first time in our lifetimes that we've had this experience where we've all tuned in to daily press conferences for years in a row, not just mm. a week, not just an election campaign, but for years. And, um, you know, from a personal point of view, it was a marathon effort, but from a point of view of a whole community tuning in and getting that information, of course it matters who the government of the day is. Mm. It matters in every sense of the word. And profoundly, the, the, the scales have been reset, haven't they? Uh, you know, all the sort of nonsense we used to hear, oh, government should, you know, get rid of red tape, government get out of the way. I mean, if anything, the pendulum swung right round the other way. Well, it had to because mm -hmm. our lives are at risk. Yeah. It Matt, literally was a matter of life and death. I've only got a few minutes left to get you each to tell me what you're going to do if I give you a magic wand and there's one wish that you can have fulfilled. Vicky, what do you do with it for the cult cultural revival post-COVID of Melbourne and Victoria? Well, parity for Indigenous communities. Parity and um, addressing those long-standing issues which... Um, people are starting to understand, but, yeah, parity. We have to have parity to be able to move forward. Mm. That's pretty straightforward. I can't see why that won't happen. Kath, can I throw that magic wand in your hands, please? It hasn't happened yet. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and don't hold your breath. Kath? Um, Truth-telling, good listening, collaboration, mm. and um, listen to the science. Mm. That's my magic wand. That's your magic wand. Sam? Uh, for me, it's the urgent need to address uh, the inequity in public spaces. Um, lots of cracks were exposed through COVID. Um, and one of them that was really uh, confronting was the quality of the public spaces where I live in Alfington, where the beautiful parks and pathways and rivers and people thronging to those places that were used so well. And that was great to see. 
but in Collingwood, I think, um, it wasn't possible for everybody to follow the rules and have the public spaces and then the quality of those public spaces. And across Victoria, across Australia, um, that's a, a really important thing for us to understand about ourselves and to prioritise. So even though we're the Garden State? Yep. It's, and, yeah, and there's lots of different types of public space. So gardens, absolutely, but also other open um, shared spaces. Um, our own experiment every year is the M Pavilion is to actually demonstrate what's possible. And I hope that we can, over time, transplant that more. And we're really turning our attention to landscape architecture in, in, in response to what we see as an urgent need to put that to the front. Sandro, magic wand time. Yeah, I mean, I think um, echoing my fellow panellists, um, parity and equity, uh, when I reflect that um, postcode is probably still the strongest predictor of your life expectancy as a Victorian, we've got a long way to go. Um, and I think that there is an opportunity as we look to recovery and everything we've learned over the last two years, including the importance of government and public health and social contract and all those things to think about a wellbeing economy for Victoria. Um, New Zealand has a wellbeing budget. Wales has an act that um, means that politicians have to think about future generations when making legislation now. Um, you know, climate change is going to make COVID look like, you know, a, a small blip. Um, and we need to be thinking about fu the future and, and actually building back fairer um, and achieving, as Vicky said, parity. But how do you do that? How do you hold governments accountable over time and ourselves accountable over time? And I think it's about building that into, um, you know, how we, how we budget, how we measure progress and how we think about governance. We've had all sorts of ideas and suggestions, inspirational insights as well from our four panellists. I hope that's given everybody who's watching, observing and participating a few things to go on with. It's certainly, I think, laid down a challenge to the private sector, the public sector, to philanthropists, to leaders from all different walks of life, from culture, the arts, from government, from industry and business, all sorts of ideas that we can pick up on. The one undeniable truth is there's no shortage of ideas and there's no shortage of energy. We've seen a little bit of on display. So thank you very much to each of you on the panel. I hope that's given everybody something positive to finish on because, by goodness, we need more positive, positive thinking and positivity. We've had too much negativity. Let's leave that behind. So thank you very much for joining with us and good day. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this very insightful and thought-provoking discussion, and we look forward to seeing you at the museums very soon.